and welcome to Notch Waffen Pilot with Penny Bradley. Have fun, Penny. Welcome to Notch Waffen Pilot, and today's guest we have Steve Bassett, who is, in my opinion, the most important person in the entire UFO movement. And if you don't know who he is, you have homework. Welcome, Steve. You there? Hi, hi, Penny. I'm sure I have colleagues that would uh, take issue with that statement, but uh, that's very kind of you. Well, um, I was one of those floater people for decades where that I would occasionally buy a book and... Uh, I've been keeping up with it since the 1970s, so you were always on my radar, and when Odin, my producer, said, oh, I would like for you to contact this man, here's his email, um, I got really excited, so thank you for joining us today. Um, my pleasure. Now, um, the further exploits. Um, Steve Bassett was basically the the person who was lobbying Congress for disclosure for literally decades and he put together the citizens hearing on disclosure. I believe that was in 2011? I'm not 13. sure. 13. Mm -hmm. um, 2013 was when I started getting my memories back, so things that happened around me then were kind of fuzzy. But, um, yeah, um, I'm really tickled to have you back. Um, I, I, would, I would like to um, start with how did you get into the UFO movement? Yeah, I, I wouldn't call it the UFO movement. I call it um, the um, disclosure movement, really, because uh, okay. that's what it is. The movement, the UFOs, is a acronym created by the uh, Air Force and, and Rupel to uh, keep things from getting out of hand. <laughs> it's an acronym that's long since uh, used up its life, lifespan. Um, but that was the phenomena called the phenomenology. Uh, lights in the sky, yeah. saucers, so forth. Get it. But there's so much more to it than lights in the sky. There's the lies on the ground. And that was the, the truth embargo that the government imposed on this. It used to be called the UFO cover-up, but that term is not valid. So the um, uh, embargo was a policy to keep the issue from being formally recognized and thus contain it. Not completely, because the extraterrestrials can pretty much go and come as they please. But eventually there was a, a, a growing dissatisfaction amongst more and more people that this obvious phenomena being denied by the government was simply, well, embarrassing, uh, irritating, <laughs> yes, uh, yeah. emblematic of, uh, of government distrust of the people. You can't handle the truth. We can. Uh, and eventually it became a disclosure movement as, as the term came into play. Stephen Greer brought the term into play in early 1990s with the disclosure project. Um, mm -hmm. it, but his, I think the disclosure he was using and referring to was the process, the process of disclosing, revealing. I think in so late too. Yeah, in late 1990s, I added a, I made a little change and, and added the, a capital D disclosure. And that was not the process of revealing. That was that was in, intended to uh, represent an event. What event would that be? And that would be the event in which the heads of state finally tell us that the ETs are here, whether it's our president or the Canadian prime minister or the UK prime minister or the Russian president or the Chinese president. Pick a president. When that happens, and of course, all will follow. It won't be like one is going to be making that statement and the rest are going to be saying, I don't know what you're talking about. No, 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 no. That's well, disclosure didn't, day. Didn't, 
we have one of the, the Russian presidents. Um, they have a prime minister and a president, and right. one of them, not Putin, but the other guy, came out with that. Yes, ETs were real and on and was interacting with Earth. And um, Paul Hellyer from Canada's um, Ministry of Defense mm -hmm. also said that they were real. So haven't we had that event and people just yawned and ignored it? No. Uh, Paul Hellyer was not the Prime Minister of Canada. Gordon Cooper said it. He wasn't uh, the president. Neither was Edgar Mitchell. Um, and uh, Medvedev was Prime Minister, admittedly. <clears throat> but what he simply... What happened there is he, he made some interesting comments uh, to a reporter thinking, possibly thinking, that they weren't live. Mm. Uh, I think he knew they were live, and I think he made those comments to send a little message to the U.S. But they, they, they didn't, he didn't confirm an extraterrestrial presence, but he certainly, it was a provoc provocative statements that he made. That's not disclosure. If Putin says it, matter-of-factly, and it can't be a, in some allu an alluding to it. It can't be an indirect. It has to be absolute, firm, clear, and concise, like any announcement from the office of the president would be. Uh, like if you're going to announce you're going to war, you don't hold a press conference you know, and bring the press into the White House and say, we might go to war, might not go to war, not sure, could happen, uh, but our tanks are starting to uh, get warmed up. No. You declare war and you make it clear. Same thing with the ET issue. Uh, when a president, when a head of state goes in front of the the people, meaning in the press press release, what a press conference, and says matter of factly, yes, we have had, we ha we do have a, a an extraterrestrial engagement, non-human intelligence. That's disclosure, capital D. And the movement is about getting there, getting the government to do that. Okay. Uh, and that's all activism usually is. Uh, activism is almost always about trying to get a government and authority to do something it doesn't want to do. And it's tough because governments have power and money and influence. And so the citizens are saying, we want you to do this. And the government says, no, we don't want to do that. And the government can has lots of tools at its disposal. And then the activist movement continues and sometimes goes on for decades before the government finally relents because the thing that is requested is the right thing to do. Getting governments to do the right thing is the formidable challenge for, I think, all peoples in this world. Letting governments do the wrong thing is, of course, the biggest drawback and, and um, liability that the world's people uh, have. And so it's a question of balance in the world. How many, how many people are, how many times are governments allowed to do the wrong thing? By, for whatever reason, versus how many times the government does the right thing. And if that balance gets too out of line, if it's too much on the wrong thing, versus, things start going really bad. And if it's too, uh, right thing versus higher versus wrong thing, things go better. Uh, that's a simple way of looking at history for 10,000 years if you don't want to read all the books. So uh, uh, disclosure is the right see, thing to I do. I see them doing what they consider to be the right thing for themselves and the rest of us be damned. Uh, yeah, yeah, one can qualify it, right. Yeah, you can qualify it, but uh, if if it's mm -hmm. the right thing means the right thing for everyone. Uh, so doing the right thing just for the government obviously excludes everyone else, and therefore it's not the right thing. I'm not sure what you would call it. It's selective, qualified. Uh, so, but that's kind of a common sense thing. I mean, one could. And it can be debated. I mean, it's, 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 it's possible for governments to do what they think is the right thing. Uh, and sometimes they know damn well it's the wrong thing. And that's, that's two different dilemmas. If you're an activist movement trying to get a government that's doing something that it thinks is the right thing, but in fact is wrong, that is easier than trying to convince a government to do the right thing when they know damn well they're not doing that. They're doing the wrong thing. That's a tougher road to hoe. In the early days of this movement, going back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, um, I, I think we were, we, ha we were dealing with a government that felt it was doing the right thing. 
on embargoing the truth of the ET issue. And it was tough. And they, and they, they really clamped down very, very hard. After the Cold War ended, more and more people inside government began to feel that the embargo was not the right thing, but they were maintaining it. Right? They were maintaining it anyway because they felt they had to. Um, and that's, that got kind of sticky. So what do you do? It's, it's, once, it's the once they run. start lying, they feel they have to keep lying yeah. or admit that they lied, which is, which is really hard for them. I know it's it hard really for anybody. Hard. It was hard for Bill Clinton to apologize to those of us who had been subjected to MK Ultra. Uh, it's hard. It's well. It's it's easier to apologize for something you weren't involved in. Yeah, that was easy for Bill. Apologizing for something he was involved in, namely the affair with Alinsky, a lot harder. Yeah. Uh, so, um, um, but one of the one of the the huge liabilities about lying uh, is that once you start, it is very hard to stop. Mm -hmm. It's a real, and, and that implies to the most basic relationships. If if uh, a husband or if a spouse is lying to their spouse, or a child is lying to their parents, and they get that going, boy, oh, yeah. it is tough uh, because you've got to lie. Usually, you end up having to lie in order to protect the previous lies. And it, it gets, and the more it goes forward, the more previous lies you have to defend. And it, it can destroy relationships, literally, destroy families. When governments go down that road, it can bring down the government, literally bring it to a, an end. Uh, it's happened before. The United States has been in, in, in uh, how would you say, engaged in so much lying uh, in the 20th century, but worse since World War II. After World War II, the lying really got going, that it's really got an entangled situation that, became very difficult to extricate itself from. And literally, you have to have people die off. In other words, a ge couple generation of people who were promulgating uh, years and years and decades of lies have got to pass so that people not connected to those lies can then maybe come forward and say, well, here's the truth, even though they know they're going to get probably hammered for the lies of their predecessors now passed. And that's tough, too. And, and as a result, governments break down. It's a trust factor. Every government has got to have a level of trust sufficient to maintain what we'll call a functional society. You drop below that level and uh, society starts to unravel. The United States has been dancing on that line for some time, and we've seen substantial yeah. unraveling in various aspects of the American society. Uh, the United States has been uh, dancing on that line since, uh, I would say since... Uh, uh, the Spanish flu. So it's been a hundred years, and society is is in a lot of ways just really crumbling. Um, I don't know about back east where you are, but in California, um, we're noted for our tolerance of each other, and it's getting to the point where people are just unable to speak to each other anymore because things have gotten so hard here. Um, yeah. We lost 80% of our, our small businesses in my county due to the COVID shutdowns. And so that's got business owners basically pitted against the health department at this point. And... None of this was really affecting us until October. Meanwhile, you have... None of what? Uh, None of what was affecting us? Um, we had, in the first 10 months that everybody was talking about the pandemic, we had a total of five deaths in my county. And so it wasn't actually affecting us, except we were subject to a shutdown. So, um, we did have an issue that the governor got mad about, where our sheriff's department had 
deputies at the main highway into our county, and if you didn't live here, you weren't allowed in. Mm -hmm. But that's probably why we only had the five deaths in that time period. I, uh, let's just say that uh, the situation with COVID I'm following very closely, very, very closely. But it's not my area of expertise. So I think I'm going to stick to the ET issue. <laughs> okay. Um, and in that area, we've had a lot of lying. National security is where the lies are really most dangerous. When you're lying about war, that's very dangerous to a society. Mm -hmm. uh, and when you're lying about something as profound as extraterrestrials, that's going to be a problem. That's going to be a danger. And in general, national security area, the government has given itself the license to lie. It's a legal thing under the yeah. National Security Act. Yeah. They, they can lie in order to, quote, if they feel it is a national security matter. But what happened is that when you lie, it solves an immediate problem. It's, it's, it's a short-term solution, uh, but it's a long-term problem. And so the government discovered that when they lied for national security reasons, it made life easier. And so they decided, well, let's lie about some more things and make life easier uh, in more ways. And then it becomes addictive. In other words, you classify everything. Uh, because, mm -hmm. hey, the less people know, the less they're going to ask us about, the less reporters know, and we call it national security. And so you can lie about, I don't know, uh, the lunch menu at the Pentagon's cafeteria, whatever. You can, I mean, you, can, you can classify that, rather. And so we developed an unbelievable mass of classified documents and information that's costing a fortune to maintain classified. We classified people and programs, which essentially put people in stovepipes uh, where they couldn't quite communicate. And we went crazy. Mm -hmm. Uh, and we justified yeah, it because of all the nuclear weapons that were pointed at us from China and from from uh, from Soviet Union. And so, while the nuclear weapons were a threat, uh, the lying ended up also being a serious threat to us. And we have not gotten rid of the nuclear weapons, and we haven't stopped the lying. And so, no one should be surprised that well, we we're still spending over a trillion dollars a year on defense, and other nations are doing the same. Uh, my understanding is that we are spending more than the next 10 nations combined. On In 1918, I'm sorry, 20, somewhere around 28, 20, 2008, 29, I forget the exact year, we hit a milestone. And that particular year, the United States spent more in military and defense than all of the other nations in the world combined. It was kind of a milestone event. Uh, since then, we've, it, we've fallen back from that um, for various reasons. Other nations have picked up, perhaps. And so now it's easily the top ten. Uh, but at one point, okay. it was all the rest of the world. And in spite of all that, people were flying planes into our buildings and hacking our computers and things like that. So we're spending a vast amount of money and not getting results. Uh, and that's creating massive problems for the United States. So we, we have a dysfunctional situation in America, uh, abroad, across a broad spectrum of institutions, and we're going to pay a heavy price if we don't fix things pretty soon. Well, we are the world reserve currency. Um, for now. Country. For now. And China has been trying to supplement and then replace us in that category and when that happens we will stop having all of this extra money to spend and we'll find ourselves at the third world status that we actually are we have no manufacturing anymore we import almost everything and our food supply is really precarious the Agriculture in California was shut down because of the drought and never allowed to start back again. And so, what is it, three of the last ten years, the, um, the entire Mississippi River Valley has flooded out. So crops, once they were able to be planted, it was, it was past their season. And so there were low... Um, 
low harvest and now we're in a shutdown where only essential workers are actually working and so when we lose that reserve currency status we're going to be in in deep trouble and people need to be aware of that and that's another thing that the government is lying about because this reserve currency status is the underlying problem between us and China right now is because China is manufacturing almost everything that we use and they want to be done with us being able to print money. Their currency is tied to ours where that they are always in a position where their currency is worth is easier to purchase than ours is on the forex market and so the issues going on people are thinking that it's all military or that these guys are just engaged in an ego struggle and the truth of the matter is it's an economic war and it's been going on for two decades now and it's finally getting to the point where they're talking about arming against each other and there's saber rattling now over Taiwan and Hong Kong and both of these are hot spots and the media is just mentioning them like oh China's just just being ridiculous but the truth of the matter it's an underlying economic war and the United States has destroyed countries for less well, we won't be disturbing China. What, what, can I, what would you like to know about the extraterrestrial issue right now? I'd like to know what you've been doing with it um, since the citizens' hearings. Because uh, I've been involved in my own little corner of disclosure. And for the last year, I've been doing podcasts and radio show and not doing as much research into the outlying community as I had before so I'd, I'd like to know what you've been doing since 2013 the citizen hearing on disclosure was held in in 2013 as a uh, an attempt to show the Congress and the political media what hearings would look like if they were actually held in Congress these are I mean hearings not just a single one-day hearing which is what we had in 1968 yeah. And uh, it, it was successful in that regard. We we had 42 witnesses, six members of former members of Congress, and it was held pretty much like a real hearing would be, and and was extremely uh, well received. It was uh, live streamed over the internet for people that couldn't make it down to the National Press Club, including members of Congress or journalists, and then we fit a video at all and put the record of the citizen hearing on. 10 DVD discs, mm -hmm. uh, 30 hours. So that was step one. Um, then I touched, I think, 12 hours of them. Thank you. A lot of people's view of this issue changed over because of that. Uh, and then the next step was to uh, wait until the beginning of the 2016 campaign, presidential campaign, which in our country starts about two years ahead of time and cost a couple of billion dollars. We're the only nation that does this. Money that could be spent to help a lot of people we spend to try to, to get another government that ends up pretty much the same as the last government. Uh, but that's how we roll until we change the rules. Uh, so this was going to be a spectacular election. Uh, it was going to cost a fortune, and it did. And it was going to have the first woman candidate that was considered a favorite big time favorite to to become president and it started that campaign started in late 2014 two years ahead of the election so it, at that time november 2014 i delivered uh, a full set of the citizen hearing on disclosure uh, dvds to every every office every house and senate office in washington and then a group of people that were working for me as volunteers, working with me, uh, mostly from a 
a, a, a single at Facebook group, a couple thousand people. We uh, bombarded Washington with uh, tweets. We created a, what is called a tweet storm. And okay. using Twitter handles for all of the key committee people, because not all the committees are relevant to this issue, as well as all the politicians, all the political media in town, uh, we hit them with about two and a half million tweets, most of which had That's hashtag disclosure, right, to let them know that something was happening, to let them know that the DVD sets have been delivered and that uh, the issue was going to be raised in this election. Uh, I then I, follow, I arrived in Washington shortly after that, December, to late November 2014, and immediately began to work the uh, press uh, with the issue of the, e the ET issue being part of the 2016 presidential campaign because of the connection between the Clinton campaign team and the issue, the extraterrestrial issue. Uh, yeah. Probably the most known and recognized and, and intense engagement of the issue by any political team uh, going back all the way to 1993. And this time the, the press bought into it. Efforts to do this prior had not succeeded, but this time they, they had a leading candidate with an obvious connection to the issue and they started writing about it, putting enormous pressure on the Clintons. What are they going to do? How are they going to address it? They, they, they thought about stonewalling it, but the press wouldn't let them. So they started making public statements about the ET issue. And that, that it went all through 2015 and 2016. Nothing like that had ever happened before in American history. Uh, ultimately, about 400 articles in mainstream press, mainstream print articles, were written about the connection between candidate Clinton and the ET issue. Countless hundreds, if not thousands, of other uh, internet uh, pages or articles were, were, were also created, but not mainstream, and off to the edge, but plenty of that. Mm -hmm. uh, it got a huge amount of attention. And so that succeeded, uh, and by the time we were approaching the election, I was confident that the plan was going to work, and that was that uh, the Congress would, under, would, would realize that the hearings on the ET issue would not be a problem. They could do them. Two, they realized that the candidate uh, that was going to be the president was being covered uh, in the, all over the world about her connection and her people's connection to the issue. And that thirdly, they, I think, calculated that she intended to disclose. Once she was president, she was going to force the issue to disclose her by certainly helping to bring hearings about, which would have ended the truth embargo in 2017. So... Mm -hmm. There was a lot of reason to believe that she would because she was in the group that Lawrence Rockefeller gave copies of his, his Correct. documents. That's when it began. Very important moment in history. Rockefeller brought the Clinton presidency into the issue, which mm -hmm. brought the Clintons into the issue, who had long-term aspirations. Uh, and as a result, the issue has been connected to them and part of the dialogue to some degree or another since 93. So what's that? that was 23 years going into the election. So, yeah, and plus her husband was stonewalled. He was, he was denied in, uh, access. He was lied to. He was manipulated, and he was stonewalled, and they knew it, and she was mad, very mad about that. So she was going to reclaim the legacy that he was denied. And so everything from, was going well. I think from what I've heard that... Nixon was the last one that had full access, and that uh, Carter was the last one who had partial access. Not exactly. Uh, Not Carter had no access. Nixon had quite a bit of access. George has uh, probably as much as he wanted. George H.W. Bush had all the access he wanted. Well, I knew uh, that Papa Bush did, but... Yeah, uh, so th he was the last president that has had unfettered access. Uh, Clinton, no. George Bush, no. Trump, no. And all it's that. That's like uh, 16, no. that's 19 years Yeah. Uh, in which the President of the United States is basically out of the loop on the most important issue in the world. So that, that right there is a huge dysfunctional marker yeah, in terms of where American society is. Uh, if you're doing that, then you're not... Unconstitutional because the... Yes the head of the military should have access to all of that 
because it's a threat. The president should have access to all of that. He's the head of the military. That's right. So he should have it, or she should have it, and they, they didn't. And in fact, they were lied to and, and manipulated. So the, the, the ET truth embargo went from being a reasonably sound national security policy to being probably the biggest constitutional violation in American history. Maybe. And more and more people inside the military intelligence complex began to realize that and, and understand it, which is why when they realized that Clinton's intentions were almost certainly to disclose, and the news, news was covering all of this, that they took uh, a, a rather extraordinary step. Uh, and, and I say they, I'm not referring to the Pentagon as a formal institution or the CIA, but rather people within these entities, okay. uh, mostly agencies and the DOD, not, not, the, not the military services decided to take unilateral action and they, they, they had to do it in a safe way though. It was, they couldn't just do anything. They, they had to operate, they had to be done very carefully. And so what they did was they, they uh, created the basis to launch a non-governmental organization that would be staffed by former members of the military intelligence community, no longer under what we'll call government payroll. In other words, they're private citizens again. Mm -hmm. And because of that, they were that organization was able to do things that simply could not be done from within the military intelligence complex and advance the issue in a profound way, getting towards what I think they felt was right, which is ending the truth embargo. That organization was called the To the Stars Academy, is called the To the Stars Academy of Arts and Science. Mm -hmm. We call it the To the Stars Academy or the TTSA. And it moved it eventually. Uh, well, maybe this way. It was supposed to launch in 2016 or January 2017, but Secretary Clinton didn't win the election, which upended the process. It was an historical bump in the road, I guess you could say. And they were caught pretty much um, you know, yeah, hanging in midair. Uh, what to do? They hung that way for 10 months, and then they finally announced in October of 2017 and uh, made their first dramatic move, which is to take some huge stories to the New York Times to be vetted yeah. and ultimately published. Uh, those stories were a milestone as well. And in fact, when those stories hit the New York Times front page, as I've said many times on many interviews, the world crossed the Rubicon on the extraterrestrial disclosure issue. I, there was I, be no going back. I would agree, except that my real world friends never even saw it. It was a non event for them. And who is, who, who is them? Uh, my neighbors real world. Neighbors? Uh, you just mean people, people in your community? People outside the the disclosure movement. Well uh, the the New York Times stories have been seen by hundreds of millions of people around the world. The gun camera clips, which were the first ever formally released by the government, have been seen by untold millions of times. Uh, there's been nearly 700 articles written about the TTSA and subsequent developments emanating from their initial activities. Uh, all those are archived on my, my, my website, paradigmresearchgroup.org, and you can go and read them all. And so this was an extremely impacting event that normally would have blown up into a major historical development. But the circumstances prevented it uh, because the political circumstances, uh, when they, at the time that they finally uh, announced themselves and made their move, were unprecedented in American history and really prevented uh, that their 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 goal from being achieved at that time. In other words, they had to take it slow until mm -hmm. things changed. And it was like I and I, I I liken it to a hurricane. You uh, you want to play baseball and you go on outside and you got your bat and your ball and your gloves and everything and everybody's lined up, but there's a hurricane comes in. Now you can choose to play baseball in a hurricane, but it won't be a very Night, uh, enjoyable game, almost impossible to play, or you can hang out in the dugout, um, 
uh, read books about baseball, play catch until the hurricane passes. And that's what they had to do. But they still accomplished a great deal. Uh, but it had to be more behind the scenes. So their public activities slowed down, but their, their private or behind the scenes activities continued creating the basis for what I think is going to happen now, which is to finally end the truth embargo, uh, hopefully this year, preceded by co the congressional hearings we've been trying to get all this time. I think the stage is now set for those hearings to take place. Well, that would, that would be a major step forward. Um, yeah, it would be the most profound event in human history. Bigger than anything that's ever happened to humans since the day they crawled out of the primordial sea. Have you heard about the project that's totally independent of government for official first contact? You uh, independent of government and what? I didn't catch that last part. For official first contact. There are a number of private projects out there that are, how would you say, addressing first contact. Um, uh, and uh, some of them are serious, some of them are fun. But first contact is not disclosure. First contact, well, first contact, actually, the first contact is a misnomer, a misphrase. There has been contact with ETs forever, uh, mm -hmm. as far as you want to go back. Uh, and, okay, fine. In ancient times, that contact could be more uh, robust, but not a problem, because ancient civilizations, hell, at one time, we didn't even have writing. So, so you could have a lot of contact and then just leave. And all, all that would move forward in time would be myths and interpretations of whatever happened. But I think that did happen. Perfect. And then there was a substantial lull. Uh, and then it, re it started to re-engage in the modern era. And, and so what, what kind of contact have we had in the modern era? In, uh, individual covert contact. In other words, the contactees are being engaged by extraterrestrials. So that's contact. On a, I guess you could say on a one-on-one -on -one basis. That's not the contact, of course, that is uh, the movement is, 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 is trying to get to. And that's open contact. Open contact is not an extraterrestrial taking someone from their bedroom at 2 in the morning for an examination. Open contact is extraterrestrials engaging our governments and that engagement is actually being conveyed to us. We know about it. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not covert contact with governments, it's open. And that's the ultimate contact. That's what we're trying to get to. And there are people addressing that. But first, almost certainly, you get disclosure. Disclosure is not contact. Disclosure is a self-acknowledgement by the human race to itself that the ETs are effect here. Uh, and that is the goal of this disclosure movement, clearly and simply. It's that simple. Once that happens, the engagement of this issue by the world will exponentially increase. And it will be that period of autodidactism and engagement that will lay the groundwork for open contact with extraterrestrials with a minimum amount of disruption, I guess you could say. Uh, I, I, I guess, um, my, my gut feeling is two years. Disclosure this year, open contact 2023. Okay, because the, the group that I have contact with is planning a ship's land, civilians interact, 32 aces involved, and they're planning it for this fall. Well, that would be full open contact, and if that happens, uh, that group will achieve a fairly, spe a, fair, uh, a very special place in history. Um, I can only say that I hope disclosure happens before that, because if the world does not self-disclose the ET presence to itself, and suddenly huge numbers of ships are landing uh, somewhere, whatever the, whatever the group involved, the, uh, the effect will be destructive it will be upsetting and destabilizing and not appropriate. So let's well, one more reason to have disclosure as soon as possible. 
these folks are, are stating that there is a potential disaster in the relatively near future and that they want humans to know their rescuers before they have to be rescued. Hmm. Hope you're right about that because there's always a disaster in the future, uh, either ma nature or man, man created. So uh, we can use all the help we can get. I operate under the assumption they will not help us, so uh, as to not get too uh, careless yep. about our um, policies. My attitude is that they're basically like humans, only smarter. So it's they are operating from enlightened self-interest at best. So that's not what, an unreasonable. If what they want coincides with what's good for us, great. If it doesn't, well, we need to watch out for them. It is what it is. Um, uh, yeah, In my life, I, I've treated them like used car salesmen. Uh, ultimately, we will have to deal with the extraterrestrials, and uh, we'll either handle it well or we'll handle it poorly. Uh, that's going to be up to us. But there are a few fundamental realities that are uh, dominant in terms of any thought about how we're going to deal with extraterrestrials. Probably the single most important one is that we can't defend ourselves from them. It's not possible. Uh, we naturally would like to think it is, and it's human nature to think that. But unfortunately, the laws of physics are what they are. And so we cannot defend ourselves against interstellar civilizations. If we had aid from others, you know, from one inter interstellar civilization to help us, in other words, we teamed up with an alliance, but just Earth as it is, no. And so that's just a, a, a fact we have to accept. If they wish to do us harm, they will do, they will do us harm, and there's nothing we can do about it. Uh, so let, it, they, let us hope that they are different from humans in that one critical way that destroying, conquering uh, is not part of their worldview, that they've moved past that. If they're like us, we're in serious trouble. So in that regard, they're probably not like us. And that's one of the most overriding, uh, uh, I think, points that anybody contemplating the larger topic of ET human relations. And then the second one is, I believe, at the core of this whole period we've gone through, starting in 47. Uh, and it's purely luck. It's our luck, in a way. Maybe it's not our luck. Maybe it's bad luck that we're alive when this particular circumstance developed, but we are. It's like people were alive during the Civil War, and they probably didn't want that, but they were. They had to live through the Civil War, and you could pick many examples. We're, we're being alive at this time because of developments that start in 47, and at the core of that, I believe, is a, a very simple, logical, common sense assessment that if we were to swap places with the extraterrestrials and we would be engaging this planet, right, uh, we'd be clear. And it's, it's this. If you are an extraterrestrial interstellar civilization, under no circumstance are you going to allow a, a, another civilization that is approaching will soon be able to create their own interstellar travel. In other words, they're going to solve the workaround to relativity, but is also an extremely violent civilization with very powerful weapons that would almost certainly be put on those craft and carried off into space, into the galaxy. You're not going to allow that to happen. You can't allow that to happen. And so one of the key things that people need to get their mind around is that I think disclosure and open contact for whatever benefits it may provide to either side one of the key reasons this is happening is that they need to get to open contact in order to make a very simple point to the planet in a appropriate way. Public, here's, here's the deal. And that is you can't bring your nuclear weapons into space, and so you have to get rid of them. And then you can have your interstellar craft, and you can come hang out with us. If you don't get rid of them, then we, you will never be able to build those craft. We will prevent that. That sounds maybe sci-fi-ish, but it's actually simple logic. You simply can't allow it. 
And so I believe that this whole era that we've gone through since 47 has, for whatever else may be involved, at the heart of it is that we finally, after 300,000 years, went from chipping small pieces of rock off of using a rock to chip off other rock to a point where we are on the verge of interstellar travel and we build hydrogen and nuclear weapons, atomic and nuclear weapons, and uh, are fully going to, almost certainly going to take those weapons into space. And that accounts for what we've seen happening since 1947. These are the two overriding fundamental points that, that address the ET human relationship. Those are the two that we need to be most aware of and we need to make sure that our political leaders understand and don't try to lie to us about. Uh, that would be a huge mistake on their part. And so you will have leaders uh, and certain militarists, leaders or high in government that are going to come forward and try to convince humans that they can defend themselves against extraterrestrials. They just need untold number of trillions of dollars to do it uh, and they will be lying and if we give in to their lies the consequences will be most unpleasant. So you're convinced that this hasn't already happened? Ha uh, what hasn't? Th that we have we have given in to lies uh, about that. We're not already out in space and the government's just lying about it? Um, if we are out, well, we are out in space. Uh, and certainly, with it's in terms of the solar system, we are traveling the solar system with conventional craft. We may be traveling the solar system with anti-gravitic craft because we have gotten our hands on a number of anti-gravitic craft, uh, not only us, but other countries. Mm -hmm. But I do not believe that the craft that we see in the skies all the time, and we may have re-engineered our interstellar, they're pretty cool. Uh, they're anti-gravitic, and that's cool by any standards. But mm -hmm. I don't think those that's the technology that, that goes from star to star. And so we could be out in the solar system, and, uh, but that's not that's not uh, interstellar, and that's what matters. If we were confined to our solar system, we are no threat to them. The moment we can leave that solar system, go to the star in a reasonable amount of time, we are a big threat to them, because we're an extremely dangerous species. Still, we are the most dangerous animal on the planet. We will kill anything and everything, each other, ourselves, animals, insects, life itself. We'll even kill off the entire uh, biosphere. Frankly, we're capable of doing it. There's almost nothing we won't kill. We have not yet gotten to that point. Unfortunately, we, we do it for the sheer joy of it, too. Whatever. We do it for joy. We do it out of stupidity. We do it to, for survival. Uh, but, and that's fine. But, uh, you know, and that in and of itself is not surprising. I think that most, I think the evolution of life on almost all the biospheres in the, in the galaxy have followed the fundamental principles of survival of the fittest. Darwinian evolution. There's not much reason, unless it's a, uh, a, a um, uh, an artificial structure. In other words, extraterrestrials could terraform a planet and literally create life from nothing. You know, bring life in. Uh, fine. That's that's a different. But in terms of a, a, a evolution of of a uh, of life on a planet, it's always going to be uh, Darwinian. And as a result, dog eat dog. Survival of the fittest. You're going to end up with an advanced civilization that's Darwinian, or at least operating under evolutionary principles. Uh, though we no longer evolve that way. We now evolve technologically. We're, we're no longer evolving Dor in a Darwinian fashion. So it's not going to be unusual. Uh, and they may have they may have gone that way too. They may have had to get through. To, to, once they get once you get to atomic technology, you're either ready to to, to deal with it or you're not. And if you're not ready to deal with it, you are immediate threat to yourselves. And then when you get to interstellar drive, you're a threat to everybody else. This is probably a standard history going out for forever. This is nothing new. Nothing, nothing that is happening right now since 47, or even going back, but certainly 647, is new. This has happened before countless times on other planets throughout the galaxy. And there are billions of Earth-type planets. 
or potentially it's, Earth-wide planets in the That's happened before here. That's what the Maharab Gita is about. And it's possible, but I'm uh, not, not much of a supporter of that theory. And because an advanced civilization, anything like what we have, even if it was 200,000 years old, would leave a huge amount of artifacts. And we just don't find them. So I kind of doubt it. That doesn't mean the ETs didn't come down, set up, do some wild and crazy stuff. Uh, but then they leave. And because they can take everything with them when they leave, if they want to, then uh, you don't have much left over. Uh, I think this is our this is the first global civilization, and thus this is the, the key milestone, and thus the interest and engagement of ETs of us right now is unlike anything that's been seen before. Uh, and we will, and, and I think I think it's going to go okay. I, I think that it's going to be fine. I, I I mean we could have a nuclear war at any time, and the risk is greater than it's ever been. A lot of people don't know that, but it's true. Uh, we're at, in a more unstable potential nuclear th uh, war situation than we were in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Um, well, because we have too many rogue states that now have nuclear weapons. We, well, we have we have well we have eight defined countries. We may have some non-defined country uh, non. I'm going to put it away. No, there may be some clear. countries with nuclear weapons that are undeclared. We don't know. But we, we spend a great deal of money trying to determine that. So I'm thinking we probably know every nation that's got them. However, mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that we don't know about terrorist nukes, meaning uh, somebody purchased a, a nuke from a first world country. and Anybody could have that. And that's a possibility and one of the reasons things are unstable. Uh, well, but but when, when I was in college back in the 70s, in early 80s, there were enough people from the then third world countries taking calculus, engineering, physics, and those topics, and we were taught how to build a, a dirty bomb that would fit into a suitcase, and all of these people were yeah. being taught with me. The suitcase bombs or any other rogue nukes has been a risk for a very long time, and it's not defined. And you don't hear much talk about it because the government hates to talk about things that they have failed to deal with or cannot define. And that's one of the reasons the nuclear war is, is, is such a uh, risk is great right now. Because if a non-state actor blows up a significant city with a nuke, right away there's a huge problem because we don't know who did it. And therefore, we will conclude that everybody is potentially guilty and everyone has to be looked at and tensions will just explode worldwide. Everybody will be worried that they're going to be the, and then it could be more than one, it could be a couple. So that is very doable and is not being talked about uh, like so many things. The really, really, really important stuff that the human race needs to know is on a list of things you don't talk about. And that is extremely dangerous. Uh, and we've been in that mode for some time. And that's the fault of the academics, the politicians, the journalists, intellectuals, pick it. It's their fault. They simply um, have given in to this game of shell game of, OK, everything under that shell you can't see. And that's the really important shell, right? This well, is we, may have, we, we have a question from the audience. And it may be under that shell. The question is, does the Vatican have nukes? No. Are you certain? No one can be certain of that. But if you want to put your money down, right, uh, on whether they have them or don't have them, and you put them on they have them, you're going to lose your money, almost certainly. <laughs> the Vatican doesn't need nukes. Uh, believe me, <laughs> they, they already have a massive amount of control over a lot of people, uh, and having a nuke would be just a massive liability. Uh, uh, no, no, it's just not going to happen. Now, again, you can't prove it. That's another problem. We can't prove, we, we do not know, ultimately, we can't say what's in the nuclear arsenals of any country. Uh, unless, you know, we only know what they tell us. Recently, uh, Putin told us that they had developed a hypersonic missile so fast and maneuverable that it would be utterly imp impossible to intercede, intersect, uh, intercede with. So 
what that means is is that we have even less time to we want we have let we don't have enough time to say our you know, the lord's prayer before the nuke takes us out we just announced that we have ours uh, our version of that and we have a hypersonic missile that was just announced about a month ago so well, we just on what we know series since the 80s and that's one of those those um anti-grab engines what is trb the tr3 series B. it yeah. They started with B, and I, I understand they're on G or H now. There, you know, there's. I believe we have anti gravitic uh, craft. I, I, I have to think that so does uh, Russia. But uh, anti anti gravity craft is a. It's not. Well, it's not a bomb. It no. will allow you to de deliver bombs, though, uh, yeah. and and. Uh, that would make it more dangerous. So if you had a situation where one country had anti-gravity craft and another one didn't, and the one that didn't knew about it, knew that, that would be extremely paranoia uh, uh, driving. It would be a very driving paranoia thing. Um, I don't know. Uh, I hope that both, I hope China has them. I hope all the three major nations, the three major nuclear powers have, have anti-gravity craft so that they, they, you have mutual assured whatever. Uh, uh, so we but, have a balance of terror, so nobody's stupid enough to use them. Well, that's that's the twenty. That's that's been that's been the situation since nineteen forty-seven. Mutual assured destruction is what has kept us together all this time. Kept things together. It is the most appropriate acronym ever devised. Uh, the nearest the nearest acronym to to that in terms of appropriateness is a distant second and that's mothers against m drunk driving mad m-a-d-d but mutual assured destruction mad is the most appropriate the fact that that has been the basis upon which we have kept things together since 1947 is all anyone needs to know that unless a major profound development takes place which starts to shift the world view of not just millions but billions of people and a full reassessment of geopolitical policies that ultimately we will destroy civilization. That's where we're headed. It was inevitable. I thought it was inevitable when I was a teenager. I, I, I was smarter than the average guy, and and uh, I looked at the situation you know, back in uh, you know the mid '60s, early '60s, rather, and I said, "We're going to have a nuclear war, and it's going to be all over. How can we not? That's what humans do. We've been waging war for ten thousand years. We've never stopped, and so." But it didn't happen because of mutual assured destruction, and that's what's between us and the, the devil uh, and the deep. That's we're between the devil and deep blue sea, uh, yeah. and this is untenable. It's untenable, and so. We got another question. Yes. Since disclosure began as a conspiracy, why is it that we cannot reinforce the UFO disclosure? with the entire collection of conspiracies that could prove that the aliens are amongst us? Uh, well, you got some problems with the premises there. First of all, disclosure is not a conspiracy. The truth embargo is not a conspiracy. These are this a legal policy. Disclosure is, a, is a, an event. Disclosure movement is an activist movement to obtain that event. The truth embargo, which is what disclosure is trying to end is not a conspiracy. It is a legal policy of the United States government and the other governments for national security reasons. Uh, and so, and then the issue of aliens among us, uh, they come and go. They can land, and they probably have bases. But whether they're among us, meaning hanging out down at Starbucks, I don't, <laughs> I don't see the evidence for that. I don't think, I don't think that's the case. I don't think they are among us in that sense, but they're here. And so, if among us, if they've got a base, if they've got bases around the world, which they have to have, unless they're operating completely from off planet, which it could do. I mean, it, it could do, but it's tough, a lot harder. Um, yeah, a lot if harder they have bases. They're among us in that sense, but that's not what people usually are referring to when they say that. Well, there've been a lot of rumors about bases in Nevada and I. Pine Gap in Australia, Tanzania, other places. 
there have been rumors about bases all over the place. Some of them are true. Some of some of them will stand up. Some won't. But mm -hmm. well, all that matters is they have bases. Doesn't it, 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 they're under the seabeds? They're under mountains. That's where I'd put them. If they were and clearly I think the evidence seems to point to that. Uh, they're not going to put them in Santa Monica, but uh, they have bases and they operate from that. And there's evidence for this, particularly from the contactees. So that's a big deal. So are they among us? Yes. But the exopolitical implications of ET bases is quite different from the exopolitical implications of ETs hanging out with us, right, uh, at the bowling alleys and in the supermarkets and uh, living next door. That's a whole different thing and much more frightening. And so well, I don't... Some of my neighbors think I'm one of them, so... <laughs> Well, you then, can imagine how I get treated in town. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, no, we'll I am not. Play it for all, you, play it for all I'm course. human as far as I know. So, yeah. <laughs> so again, these these distinctions are not trivial. I, I I try to stick with the basics and not get too extreme. Though some of the things I say, some people would say are extreme. But I tend to stick with Occam's razor. Uh, I don't. I go with logic. Well, I, I tend to go with what logically follows from the evidence or what's the logical exp ex uh, the most likely and logical uh, extrapolation which is really theory right but there's theories and there's theories science advances because of theories it always has when the theories are ridiculous then science doesn't advance much but when the theories are uh, solid uh, and and logical oftentimes they prove out and we, we advance to another level of knowledge and then we have more theories. And so well, when it comes to science and even when it comes to activism, the theories you choose to engage often determine your success. When I was in physics, uh, my major professor was um, trying to recruit me because I was a microbiology major. And he... he he looked at me and he said that, and this was in 1982, he said that the physicists have climbed the mountain and found the mystics already there. <laughs> and, and That was a fairly uh, arrogant statement by the physicist. <laughs> so, um, I had something similar happen to me. I, I, I was physics major at Georgia Tech, and uh, some of the physics I professors... Uh, you had a much better climate than I had. Um, some of the physicists, it was it was a kind of kind of a common thing that it would be jo joked about. But the joke would be, you know, physicists would look at somebody and say, "Look, the student would say, should I, doctor, should I uh, major in chemistry or physics?" And the professor would say, "You should major in physics. Chemistry is just stamp collecting." Chemistry, as far as I had it, was recipes and algebra. That's another way of looking at it. Um, but it's also collecting stamps. In other words, how many, how many chemicals are there? How many, how many uh, molecules are there? The infinite, an infinite number, and you just, and every mm -hmm. one of them is yeah. worth studying. So you're collecting these and pinning them to a board and studying them. The fact is, is that. Physics is the easiest, is the, I believe is the easiest science. It is clear cut, it is crisp, it is built pretty much one brick at a time, so you get a very defined edifice. Uh, chemistry is the second, uh, well, chemistry is more difficult, uh, much messier, uh, much less defined, and then biology is off the scale. Well, I mean, it was, biology I, is so complicated; it's it's just it's supercomputers and upon supercomputers. It's just to anything with biology is I admire them. I was aiming to become a pediatrician for kids with endocrine disorders. It's and, a noble goal. And I came down through this. And this was before the Americans with Disabilities Act, so. I was booted. That's so unfortunate. That's unfortunate. I didn't get my bachelor's degree, so I couldn't work in my field. So I spent my life doing home health care. So uh, did you ever 
develop, were you able to determine or even ever have an understanding of why you got lupus? I think it's very much genetic, isn't it? Um, I have some Native American in my background. Okay. Oh, that's unfortunate. I, very, I, I, I feel bad. It's very common among Native Americans. I mean, yeah, well, that's just one of the problems that Native Americans have. Uh, life is tough, uh, unpredictable, and uh, not easy. Uh, so uh, your path was. But on the upside, you got into the ET issue, and the ET issue is about to explode into the world in a way unprecedented, and you'll be a knowledge. You'll be a part of that. You'll be able to engage it, and uh, I think you'll have a very stimulating time throughout the rest of your life. Well, we have a question from someone named Cosmic Gypsy. What does Mr. Bassett think of, it, of Elon Musk? First of all, I think there's got to be a horse out there that's going to run one day in the Preakness or something that's named Cosmic Gypsy. If they haven't named a horse that, they got to do it. <laughs> that's just one hell of a name for a horse. Um, Elon it's, Musk. It's a hell of a uh, handle for someone online, too. It's a great handle, but it's also a great name for a horse. Um, Elon Musk is a rogue genius. Uh, and rogue geniuses are always entertaining and interesting. Um, and because he's a rogue, because he is very unconventional, he is able to go places that other people can't go, uh, which is, and we need him. We need people like that. A lot of, lot of human advancement has come from rogue geniuses, not just genius. I mean, there are geniuses out there, but there's been contributions that only rogue geniuses could, could do. Um, and so I respect that. Um, there is a downside to that personality, however, uh, that get, they can be problematic um, and also can be their undoing. And there have been many examples of that. Uh, he's been walking that line for some time. Uh, but I think as he's gotten older, he's maturing, he's starting to become a little bit more grounded. And uh, he survived some of the worst behaviors that, he's, that he has conducted himself in. And, and so... Yeah, he's had I, some pretty other behaviors. Yeah, and and uh, and it's not just bad behavior. I mean, it, it's it's but it, but that behavior is becoming from the fact that he he's thinking, he, he he looks at things and sees things in a very different way. And so I'm I'm not I'm not seeing it as, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I don't think he means to do harm, but he, again, he is out there, and so he's operating in a in a in a different orbit than most everybody else. In any event, look, he's maturing, and so. He is a world changer. Um, uh, he's going to end up going down in history as one of the most disruptive and, and innovative. Uh, uh, when I say him, I mean his legacy, because it's not just him. I mean, he, he hires all kinds of people to yeah. do things. I mean, these people are doing things he can't do, but he has the vision. He's kind of like Steve Jobs, Jobs, except, <laughs> you know, he, he's a jack of all trades. Uh, well, and he would I, go down I, in history. See, I see society's technology going forward with imagination. So he's right on the cutting edge of imagination. However, he is rogue. And so his, the implications of where he's going are probably not getting the kind of attention that a more centered genius might would give it. Well, I so, have serious issues with the brain chip. Sure. I mean, we should yeah. have issues with all of this. Um, in other words, he, he is, and he is, he's put out some warnings himself. I mean, I'll give him credit for that. He's yeah. put out some warnings, uh, but, and that's fine. But he's, he's, he's charging ahead with AI, and, and mm -hmm. while he, you know, it's like he's, he's, he's aware, he's willing to warn us of where it's going. 
he's he's got this split personality about it. On one side, he's saying this is the most dangerous thing on Earth right now, and on the other hand, he's going, "Damn, the torpedoes will speed ahead." That is a that is a a common uh, logical maneuver. In other words, you you're, you're heading somewhere. You, you're mm -hmm. hell bent to get there, uh, and nothing's going to stop you. But you know that there it could be the outcomes could be uh, not particularly uh, advantageous. And so you warn people about it. You're telling people, yeah, this thing, where I'm going, it's a dangerous place. And by doing that, by warning them, you're giving yourself extra uh, latitude to continue. In other words, yeah, he's continuing to do it, but he didn't warn us about it. He's done it's, that several it's times just now. like the, the health warnings on cigarette curtains. Well, they... Well, you're right. They put those warnings on and continue to, but a lot of people did react. A lot of people changed their behavior. So that's not happening with AI yet. In other words, with AI, and it's going to be the same with Neuralink, and, and you can extend this to just certain genetic work, we as a society have not responded yet. In other words, no, we haven't. We just haven't letting it said, go forward. We have not yet said there needs to be ethical standards, there needs to be limits. Right now, we're just almost ignoring that it's happening. Yeah, and these standards and limits have to have to come from institutions like the Congress. And we can't even fix a bridge right now, let alone come up with a platform on which to deal with AI in the future. So, yeah, this is another reason why things are not looking good, favorable. I mean, we, we have breakdown in, in our institutions, which are the, the – you know, I can't – as an individual, you or I cannot make major changes that are going to allow us to deal with macroscopic events. Institutions do that. Our institutions are not doing it. So on AI alone, I'm sure if, if a team of economists were to come up tomorrow with a rock-solid, iron-clad projection that if AI is allowed to continue as, as at the pace that it's developing, we're going to have – two to three billion people out of work at some time in the future and what are we going to do about those two to three billion people out of work and the answer is we have no idea we'll just wait until we have two billion people out of work and we'll decide what to do about it uh, that's a really bad uh, bad policy so we've got that mm -hmm. neural links what happens when we're, we're able to link to the machines yeah. uh, and then we're, we're creating AI weapons and when I, every time I read an article about AI rep, weapons, I'm thinking nobody on that team watched the Terminator series. I mean, they didn't watch any of those movies. They missed all those. Yeah, so, they missed uh, all that. And, and Elon wants to go to Mars. And he talks about uh, we have to go to Mars because we're going to destroy things down here and we'll be able to live up there. Well, but this is... He, this is he's going to just dump people there and his rockets could come back to earth and they're not going to have anything no oh, he's talking beyond that he's, he's that's the near-term program he, he talks long term about how we have to to have a huge population on mars and uh that's 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 that rogue in him the cost of putting people on mars is astronomical and will be astronomical for a while until we have a huge anti industry making anti-gravitic craft and then we could probably get people on Mars but the point is is that this idea that Mars is the savior of the earth is is ludicrous uh, but it gives some people license to go well it's pretty much toast here can't fix it here so let's just wait for the Mars chip it's just a mindset you don't want to have the mindset should be uh, and if and Elon may get there eventually, is it? I am the most one of the most innovative men in the world. I have vast resources, and I'm going to help everybody help you all fix this planet, so you don't have to go to Mars. That's what he's supposed to be saying, but that doesn't get press. Uh, we have the means to pretty much fix most of the, if not all, of the problems that we face. Uh, we don't. It takes a little thought and we, research. We to don't do have the will. To we it. don't have the will, and that's that's a, a different thing. And so this idea that if we go to Mars, we're suddenly going to get the will to what? We'll go to Mars, and we will end up turning Mars, Mars into a garbage dump. Look, there is a series on television 
that is had five seasons, it has one more season, I wish it had ten more seasons, that I certainly invite anybody with a sci-fi inclination or an ET interest to see. It is a masterpiece. And it's called The Expanse. And it's based upon a series of books. And essentially, the genius of this of this author, who frankly, I'm surprised it's not getting more attention. I, why am I not seeing this? Maybe he's dead. This guy should be interviewed all over the place for what he's created. Uh, what The premise of this series is that there's, there's a couple of key premises here which make it so important. One, humans will expand into the solar system. All right. Okay. Two, they will not have interstellar drive. We will we will develop some pretty damn advanced propulsion systems, but they will not be interstellar. In other words, we st we're still not working around relativity. And this goes on for hundreds of years. I forget how many hundreds of years in the future it is. And so, what is it? It it, it describes the solar system in a couple of hundred years after humans have gone out there in huge numbers and built colonies terraformed, things like that. And that is the context in which the expanse operates. And what you see, and what's so brilliant about it, is that what ultimately happens is we take the same mindsets that we've been operating on since the flood, and we've taken them out and just incorporated them in the entire solar system. The same bad politics, the same bad policies, the same uh, uh, ethnocentricities. Uh, in other words, we're just doing everything we do now, but we're doing on a solar system basis. And the science in this series is so extraordinary, it's almost impossible to find what we'll call a science plot hole, where they're doing something and any reasonable person would go, that's ridiculous. Uh, mm. that in order to, to create a, a movie or a series like that, you have to be incredibly smart and put an enormous amount of effort into understanding not only the science of today, but the science of tomorrow. Uh, and they have. And it's and an absolute the brilliant piece of work. psychology of human beings. Well, yeah, but that you know, basically they, they didn't have to do much with that. They just took the current psychology and projected it out into the entire solar system. Um, and it, but then the, the graphics, the CGI, it's a masterpiece. It has only one more season. I actually sent a tweet to Jeff Bezos saying, you know, Jeff, uh, give some thought to the possibility of just donating $100 million to your, your <laughs> video division in order to fund another five years of the expanse. <laughs> I just thought I'd put that out there in case Jeff reads his tweets, right? right. Uh, because I cannot get enough of this, and I can't wait for season six, the last one, where they're supposedly going to wrap this up. But this series should have gotten way more awards than it did. It's just, but it's advanced high-tech sci-fi, and you know that in, in terms of the, the Oscar people and the foreign press people and everything goes right over their head. So, but nevertheless, it will it will be a classic. It will go down in history, and it will be viewed and replayed forever. It's just an incredible series. There's one on Netflix that is really haunting. It's um, do tell dark and dark dark mirror or just dark 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 the German the German, the German series the right German series, and it yeah. is about Montauk and Brookhaven Labs create basically creating a time loop yeah. and that these people are trapped in it they've just taken yeah. the setting and set it into a small town in germany now obviously it's not montark itself but it's a montark type situation and it is brilliant absolutely brilliant well, uh, montark and brookhaven labs are within miles of each other they're, I know, but I don't think the setting is Island. that. Yeah, but that's not the setting. No, they they've set it into a small town in Germany. Right. That, yeah, but but that, that, the, it, it, yeah, the connection is there. Yeah. But the story is based on on something that took place at Brookhaven. Perhaps. 
but it's genius. So the, gu the guy that, that was the um, science consultant said it was. So this has been confirmed. It's not my speculation. The science consultant to the series? Yeah. Okay. I'll look for that. I'll be interested to read so that. It, it, it's um, not my... Uh, Speculation. Mr. So dark is a it is clearly science fiction, mm -hmm. uh, and it's clearly fascinating, and it's brilliantly done, and I enjoyed it. Even even though it's subtitled, I mean this is subtitles, right? Yeah, it's, it's subtitles. I loved it. Well, loved I the, the version that I heard was well, it had been dubbed into English, and they did a good job of it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sometimes I can tolerate that, but I'm sure they have. Uh, it's. But it's it's different from the expanse, and the expanse is a macroscopic projection of the human race into the far future, not far future, but hundreds of years, which is just an enormous challenge. The dark is a much more narrow themed film, but the execution of it uh, it, it, it was, is it was great. quite well done, and the plot was convoluted enough that it kept my interest. It is, you know, it, it, it's one of the one of the great exam, one of the great advantages of the streaming world now, uh, which is where it's all going. I mean, mm -hmm. all the theaters are going to be turned into uh, hot yoga studios in the near future. Um, <laughs> it created a new it created a new platform <laughs> where it was possible to generate material and content that really challenged. Yeah. Whether you were a high school dropout, obviously the challenge would be even greater. If you were a college, okay, still great. PhD, still great. Uh, and, and I'm not trying to uh, prioritize, and, uh, or rather, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, I'm just simply saying that challenges are good no matter where you are in this world. If you're challenged, it makes you think, and you end up a little smarter, even if it's incomprehensible. Uh, that's not been the way of film in America uh, for some time. Uh, it's been uh, nothing but eye candy and and yeah. uh, uh, just grinding. I don't know bread and circuses. It, it, it doesn't challenge. Even the Marvel series is, is, is just no longer challenging anymore. It's yeah. it's even boring me. I'm, I pretty much had it with the entire super 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 uh, human thing. Uh, but streaming media can do that. Uh, the budgets, you're not going to be able to make the massive budgets, but they can give some pretty good budgets. And so they and, and so they can put on a series like Dark, where you, 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 you have to go back and, and watch it. You, you, you have to go back a couple and then watch a little of it because you've lost track. and Or you, you watch it mm -hmm. over completely, and you're still learning new things. Mm -hmm. uh, same thing with Game of Thrones. And every time you watch Game of Thrones again, you find something else you didn't see. This is oh, one of I the great didn't, gifts. I didn't watch Game of Thrones. I'm... Um, I, I'm one of those that that that's too much like real world politics. <laughs> it uh, it it was it's sci-fi. It's really fantasy. There's sci-fi fantasy. That's fantasy, not really sci-fi. As fantasy goes, it was as good as it gets. But it's what I'm saying it was challenging. There's just so much there, yeah. uh, and so uh, and what we've learned is that challenging material like that will draw huge audiences, and so we're going to get more of it. Mm -hmm. And so while I'm never going to read the great books, and, and, and I wasn't going to, you know, I didn't read them in college, and I didn't read them as an adult, they are very challenging, those great books, but just they didn't have the attention span. I am looking forward to this wonderful, challenging media that's coming where you just sit there in awe and, and uh, have to struggle to, to keep up. That'll be fantastic. And so the, these will be the great books of our times, what is coming, I hope. I hope so. Um, I've seen a lot of trash out there, and so when when a series speaks to me like that, yeah. Um, so you have seen The Expanse, or you haven't? Have not. Oh, you are in for a treat. Oh, my Lord. Yeah, given your science background and everything, you're going to love this series. Uh, it's It's just... Stupid. You want to watch it on as big a screen as you got, and if okay. you have, you know, go get one. <laughs> if you don't have a sixty-incher, go get one. Um, I've got a forty-two-inch. That's ah, not bad. I think you need to upgrade. The the the, the basic four Ks sixties are super cheap now. They're not bad at all. You can get a lot of TV from 
for not much. Um, yeah, you want 60 inches for the expanse. I, I still have a 19 inch uh, monitor, so I'm one of those people. Yeah. Save it, it'll be worth a lot of money one day. <laughs> Actually, I've been trying to replace it because it, it's gotten to where when I turn off the computer, uh, I have trouble getting the monitor to come on. Um, I only switched to LED because I came home from a doctor's appointment and my youngest son was here and he had this screen for me. <laughs> That's what younger sons are for, my dear. Yeah. Um, That's how half the I, cell phones I, got sold. I had a CRT up till what? what was it, four years ago? Yeah, four I, five I, years. Got, I got myself a a uh, Bluetooth keyboard. It's called a Jolly Comb. It's a funny name. Jelly Comb, rather. Jelly Comb. Uh, made in China, probably. I don't know. The point is, it's very good, and it didn't cost much. It was 30 bucks. And so it's Bluetooth That's, with my computer. Okay, my laptop. An old one. It's got stickers on it so I can see it in the dark. <laughs> so, because I got this, this, uh, this uh, Bluetooth coupe, uh, keyboard, I simply set up uh, a nice little movable table in my chair in front of my 60-inch screen, and I do all of my computer work now on a 60-inch screen. I, I can't go back. It's, it's, it's just wonderful. Wow. Uh, it is a whole other experience, so I do my work there. Uh, and, uh, uh, of course, you can, look, I can, you can plug, actually, no. You, you have to plug a computer into a screen in order to use it, right? Uh, but, you, you know, if you put the computer in front of you, then you've got that, and then you've got the keyboard. It's kind of awkward with the, with the uh, Bluetooth keyboard. The computer's off to the side, and it's yeah. just nothing but you and a screen. Uh, I really encourage people to do that if they can. It's also easier on the eyes. Uh, um, it's easier on the neck. It's easier on everything. We got... One more question, and that will probably be the last one because we've got about 10 minutes left. Well and good. Uh, what does Steve think of, of this censorship of books, movies, and media? Does he, be does he believe that is the premise of stopping disclosure or is going to be? No, the censorship is not. The censorship issues now are not. Well, the truth embargo was a form. Well, the truth embargo didn't censor you. It just m meant that you could spend years writing a book and then it'll be dismissed out of hand because you were writing about something the government says doesn't exist. Now, censorship is not the problem. Censorship, though, is a huge issue now. It's massive. There's always been censorship. On the other hand, we've never had more free uh, ability to communicate, say what's on our mind, say bad words than ever before. Uh, and that, that had been developing also the 20th century. But uh, technology naturally kept taking us places that we weren't ready for. Atom bombs, for instance, was one example. And so the, the Internet turns up in the mid-90s, very much simultaneous with the explosion of the personal computer. And so, in, and, and nobody ordered it, nobody asked for it, it was just came, it arrived for the whole planet. And so, very starting early mid 90s, every year millions and millions of more people got on the internet and got a personal computer. And the ability therefore, what we'll call the, the backyard fence network exponentially increased by a factor of 20, 10 to the 20th power. Mm -hmm. So, all of a sudden, everybody and anybody had the ability to tell the world what it thinks, or tell somebody else what it thinks. Uh, not only par all, and all day, 24 hours a day. So, and, and people weren't ready for that. You know, they just weren't ready. Uh, a lot of them didn't do it, they didn't take advantage of it, but inevitably they were gonna take advantage of it. And not only that, it allows you to do it anonymously. And yeah. so, it was, you know, there was a time when you wanted to express your opinion to a group of people larger than 10, you had to send a letter into your local paper, and the chances are they wouldn't even publish it. 
You might put up a billboard, which would be considered kind of cool, and you occasionally see it even now, and more people would see it. And that was it. That was it. No longer. All right. And so all of a sudden, in a, the entire planet had the ability to tell the rest of the planet what it thought of it. Now, this is exaggeration because parts of the planet have restrictions. Uh, <laughs> but by and large, the Internet and the computer is everywhere. In the well, middle of the Amazon out, jungle. It's everywhere. out there whether people are listening or not. <laughs> Well, again, it, 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 lot, plenty of people are not listening, but again, there's a lot of people in this world. So if you want to express an opinion mm -hmm. now on the Internet, it's possible that 50 people will see it, 50 million people will see it. And this is unprecedented. And as a result, okay, and then institutions started to, to see the, advan the, the, the benefits of this. And people with large sums of money. And so... If you have large sums of money in 1940 and you want to get your opinion out there, you could you could buy buy some full pages in the newspaper. Mm -hmm. You could maybe start up a radio show, whatever. But by and large, you had a certain reach. Now, if you have huge amounts of money, you can literally start massive movements around the world. If you've got the money to to to, to promote. You can create all kinds of interesting phenomena. You can raise all kinds of hell. Or you can be totally broke living in a basement somewhere, and you can raise hell. We simply weren't ready for this. And so since 1995 on, we have been trying to adapt to an extremely difficult situation brought on primarily by technology, not so much a huge change in human nature, but rather a manifestation of human nature that already existed. Um, and so, uh, you sound it, like you think it wasn't a good idea. Uh, it, well, ultimately, will history will decide. I mean, it was, but it was inevitable. I mean, it wasn't like an idea. It was that it was, it was an inevitability, like mm -hmm. um, a meteor crashing into the earth. I mean, it, it, they're out there, and some of them are going to crash here, and there's nothing you can do about it. So, so, so what's happening? What you're seeing is all this screaming and yelling and everything. It's about the human race trying to adapt to an un unprecedented paradigm shift in technology. And it's it's manifesting itself everywhere. And f from, you know, some poor teenage girl, 12-year-old girl committing suicide in the bathroom because she's being bullied online by her classmates to huge organizations trying to literally switch elections, change elections by massively inundating the uh, internet with completely bogus information to cults, literally creating cults on the net, recruiting there, to terrorist organizations connecting and able to organize and on and on and on. And we weren't ready for it. We're still not ready for it. And so when Facebook or Twitter uh, tries to somehow rein in the power of the tech that they have at their fingertips, which they have, that that's them trying to figure out what in the hell do we do with this tech and the effects it's having. And uh, believe me, it's going to take a while. Uh, there's going to be a lot of problems. There's going to be a lot of damage done. But rather, I don't... I don't, I don't get angry at the fact that there's censorship developing on some of these platforms because I understand that the, the danger that these platforms present now is great. And I also respect the fact that we, we don't know how to fully deal with that danger and that these efforts are attempts to try to do that, but not surprisingly, they are extremely controversial and... Uh, and they're going to be debated intensely. Uh, uh, again, th these are macroscopic problems beyond my my poor mental abilities. I would not want to be uh, any of these tech ti ti uh, titans that are having to deal with this. I mean, th that what they're dealing with in terms of impact is nothing compared to what the the, the barons, the, the the industrial barons of the turn of the 20th century. We're dealing with because they were having they were creating problems too, but it was trivial and com in complexity compared to now. So I don't know how I don't know how this is going to go, but I do know one thing: uh, the tech giants are going to get broken up very soon. It had to happen. 
uh, Amazon and uh, and Google and uh, Facebook are going to they be have become monopolies and so entwined into society that they either have to be broken up or they have to be turned into public utilities. <laughs> yeah, top, top, yeah, yeah, public utility. That would be interesting. Um, yeah. Probably not a public utility. And the reason is, is that public utilities are fundamentally for the core needs. Uh, well, communication. Power, core needs. power. Communication. Let me tell you, you have to have water. You have to have heat if it gets really cold. The phone company was a public utility and it was communication. It was, uh, but and ultimately it, 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 it was it's the, made public. And the reason it was able internet, to be made... The oh, internet commercial. was on the phone company. I know. My phone provider is still my ISP. But in the case of the telephone, you it went from being a utility to being commercial. And by and large, that's, not, that's kind of worked out. Why? Because... Communication is I, not I essential. Don't think so. I had to change companies because the local prov the local provider stopped stopped maintaining the wiring system. So now I'm I'm on an air system when when I wanted to be on a wire, and it was because they chose to use the money to lobby the state legislature instead of repairing the wires. Uh, it's a microcosm. I I can tell you that that uh, the nature of of this just telephonic communications is so vast that there is we would have never gotten to where we are if it remained utility. It's simply too vast. In other words, utility is that company that provides electricity. All right, and and. Uh, and those fundamental essentials and water, and so you have cities that have tried to privatize those, and that has gone badly, because everybody has got to have those things, and so you make them privatized, and then they start price gouging. Uh, you don't have the competition because you can't have five water companies, things like that. So uh, I'm not surprised that AT and T, uh, that AT and T, be that t telephones became a a, a commercial situation, uh, and it's in the computer world, the internet world, communication world is, is even more complex than that. So, no, I don't see it as a utility, but um, it will be broken up. They are too big. We yeah, are at our up. time. Um, if you want to do a quick plug about where people can find you. Yeah, uh, the website is paradigmresearchgroup.org. Uh, and I have a podcast that's just just starting. It it's just got an a, an, 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 a a a, a, a uh, introductory video up. But it's disclosurewire.org. That's the easiest way to get there. It is a lot of ways to get there, but that's the key one. And that podcast will start to develop more soon. Um, and at my website, uh, you can uh, sign up for my. Updates list, my news newsletter is free. Encourage people to do that. And um, you can also, if you want to find out about the To the Stars Academy, I've got massive information there under resources and under uh, issues. If, if you go and hunt around, you'll find it. There's a huge amount of information. If you want to, get, if you want to try to understand what's going down, what's about to go down. If you go to that my site and read and, and that material, there's 700 articles about the TTSA and developments, and there's about 160 videos. You will pretty much have a pretty good idea. You'll be able to see the bigger picture and go, oh, I get it. Without that, you just got bits and pieces here and there. You see maybe on TV or an article in the paper. Uh, that's not enough to, to be able to show what's going down. What's going down right now is very complicated, very sophisticated, which is what we had to have happen in order to end the truth embargo. Uh, and but it is happening, and the embargo is going down right now. Well, I'd like to thank you for coming. And, My pleasure. And on the my show is followed by Ramona speaks the other truth, and we are logging out. Thank you very much.